Um, thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, I will talk a bit about myself in a, in a couple of minutes, but before further ado, I just want to acknowledge that we're meeting, particularly in Australia, on the land of the First Nations people. Um, I'm coming to you from Melbourne in Victoria, um, from Wurundjeri Nation, land of the Kulin people. So I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders in those communities. Also, I want to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. Um, for those people who come to us from overseas, um, you'll notice that there's the um, Australian Aboriginal flag there as well as the Torres Strait Islander flag. So we'll talk about Torres Strait Islander people and that's a um, distinct group of Indigenous people located off the north coast of Australia. So just in case you're wondering what that means, that's um, where they're from. Um, my background is I've been a community psychologist for about 25 years and I've been working in family violence um, for about that long as well, working um, largely with male perpetrators of family violence, but also with survivors and with children to, to a lesser extent. Um, I did my PhD um, about a decade and a half ago on emotional and psychological abuse with um, Professor Isaac Prilatensky and Professor Jill Asprey at Victoria Uni. Um, because as I was working as a practitioner with men who had been violent against their family members, um, we were getting reports back from their um, partners and ex-partners that lots of their physical violence and sexual violence had stopped um, once we started working with them, but not necessarily the psychological and emotional abuse. So I went down the rabbit hole of researching that um, and you know, I've done other work on that, which I won't talk about today. Um, so that's my background. Most of my work at the moment is based on prevention of violence against women. So doing lots of work with, um, with organizations and sporting clubs on um, bystander training and working with policies and practices. So I can talk a little bit about that at the end, um, but I'm conscious of, about the time. Um, I've got a few qualifiers today. You'll, you'll, I'll be using the term family violence predominantly because that's the concept that we use in Victoria, but we also, I'll be using that term interchangeably with domestic violence and intimate partner violence, gender-based violence. There's various different conceptual frames around this. I know they're all got um, distinctions, but I'll be using them interchangeably today. Um, I also may lapse into stereotypes every now and again. So I might talk, for example, about working class men that I've worked with. So if I do that, please um, imagine that a, a visible asterisk pops up on screen and, it, and the subtext is that I know that that doesn't represent all men equally, that there's variations within that, so, but it will just save me the, um, having to go through that every time I talk about that. We also know that this work is um, very provocative and confronting, so please um, look after yourselves during this session. As, as we're not live, we can't um, create the same amount of safety that we normally would face to face. Um, the 1800 respect number that's up on your screen is an Australian number, a 24 hour, seven day a week counseling service for people who have experienced family or domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, and I encourage people in other countries to um, go to your local equivalent of that if, if, the, if that's possible. What I'll be talking about this morning, or this morning my time at least, is um, looking at violence and under, trying to get a, um, an understanding of violence. We'll be working, I'll be showing some models of working with men who have been violent in their homes. Then I'll introduce the topic of complex trauma into the field. There's been some reluctance to talk about this with um, men who have been violent with their families. And I'll explain that a bit further as we go through the session. Then I'm gonna look at a couple trauma models which may be useful in this area and look at how we could fuse models together and, and start off on a new direction. But my first question to you here and is about the function of violence and abuse. So I might get, get you to put into the chat room your thoughts on why people are violent. So if, if we throw up the big question as to why do people use violence and abuse, um, what would your answers be off the top of your head? And Helen, I might get you to field some of these um, responses because I can't see them with no my screen. No problem, Peter, nothing there yet. So, oh, here we are, power. We've got power from Joy. Has, she's contributed to the idea of power. Control, because they can. 
fear, history of trauma, maybe as a defense mechanism to express frustration, feeling threatened, control, loss of control, uh, relate to how they were brought up, learnt behavior, unmet needs in some way, shape or form. Um, so control, inability to healthily express emotions. Sorry about the dogs in the background. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, the dogs are always welcome. And, and so are those comments. So thanks for that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, activity there. If we were face to face, we'd have a bit more time with it. Um, so it's always a great pleasure to work with such a um, brilliant audience because um, these are what I prepared before. So there's multiple reasons why people um, use violence and abuse. Um, largely it's about power and control as people have been talking about, or it's a, it's a very simple, quick way of getting what you want. Um, you know, you can rob people, you can get money, you can get people to be quiet, you can do a whole range of different things through using violence. So the sad news, of this talk is that violence is going to be with us for a lot longer. Um, we, we won't be able to eliminate violence because it's been, because it's such a, um, it has such an immediate response with people and it's so effective. Um, what we do want to do though, is stop people from using violence as much as possible. So when we look at um, different models of violence, we can look at it through different lenses. Um, this is a summary of some of the chapters in Bandy Lee's work on violence. Um, so we can look at it th from a biological perspective where we focus on epigenetics or brain regions or hormones or aspects like that. We can look at it psychologically by looking at things like triggers or um, biases or, or um, people's sense of um, mental illness or personality disorders or areas like that. There's symbolic or spiritual violence, which we can we can explore this topic through. So we can look at cult violence or mob violence or vengeance, um, those aspects like that. From a sociological level, we can look at uh, factors like exclusion or identity or connection or terrorism um, or symb uh, politically or economically or structurally, we can look at things like um, wars and rebellion and power and control through it, you know, through a um, tribal or, or a, um, on a nation, national basis. We can look at um, systems of violence like apartheid or um, look at the topic through gender or race lens or, you know, we could focus on settings like prisons or healthcare or housing and so forth. And then there's the, the environmental and nuclear lens that we can look at where we can look at um, aspects like resource scarcity and some people have used that as an explanation for violence um, or the, the prospect of nuclear threat and existential risk of um, us being blown up by other nations. So one of the joys of being a community psychologist is that we can look at this through multiple lens and look at how we can connect those perspectives together. Um, here is the high wire act of my presentation this morning where I'm going to um, call on Helen to play a, a it's a snippet from a TED talk by um, Robert Sapolsky. But just before you do, Helen, I'll introduce Robert. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, met him before, he's a biologist who, and also a primatologist. So Robert Sapolsky um, looks at baboon tribes and tries to understand behavior through tribal behaviors of very aggressive um, primates, such as baboons. But he also looks at the biology. So this um, section of his TED talk on our best and our worst behaviors um, is a way that he uh, presents violence that fuses together multiple layers of intervention. So Helen, I was wondering if you could test our technological limits and see if we can play that now, please. Do I need to stop sharing? Have you managed to see my screen now? I can, or, yes. Do you, yes. You want to press play and we'll... Yeah, I will. Hang on a second and play. For starters, what's totally boring is understanding the motoric Thanks. aspects of the behavior. Your brain tells your spine, tells your muscles to do something or other and hooray, you've behaved. What's hard is understanding the meaning of the behavior. 
because in some settings, pulling a trigger is an appalling act. In others, it's heroically self-sacrificial. In some settings, putting your hand on someone else's is deeply compassionate. In others, it's a deep betrayal. The challenge is to understand the biology of the context of our behaviors, and that's real tough. One thing that's clear, though, is you're not going to get anywhere if you think there's going to be the brain region or the hormone or the gene or the childhood experience or the evolutionary mechanism that explains everything. Instead, every bit of behavior has multiple levels of causality. Let's look at an example. You have a gun. There's a crisis going on, rioting, violence, people running around. A stranger is running at you in an agitated state. You can't quite tell if the expression is frightened, threatening, angry, holding something that kind of looks like a handgun. You're not sure the stranger comes running at you and you pull the trigger. And it turns out that thing in this person's hand was a cell phone. So we asked this biological question, what was going on that caused this behavior? What caused this behavior? And this is a multitude of questions. We start, what was going on in your brain one second before you pulled that trigger? And this brings us into the realm of a brain region called the amygdala. The amygdala, which is central to violence, central to fear, initiates volleys of cascades that produce pulling of a trigger. What was the level of activity in your amygdala one second before? But to understand that, we have to step back a little bit. What was going on in the environment seconds to minutes before that impacted the amygdala? Now, obviously, the sights, the sounds of the rioting, that was pertinent. But in addition, you're more likely to mistake a cell phone for a handgun if that stranger was male and large and of a different race. Furthermore, if you're in pain, if you're hungry, if you're exhausted, your frontal cortex is not going to work as well. Part of the brain whose job it is to get to the amygdala in time saying, are you really sure that's a gun there? But we need to step further back. Now we have to look at hours to days before. And with this, we've entered the realm of hormones. For example, testosterone, where regardless of your sex, if you have elevated testosterone levels in your blood, you are more likely to think a face with a neutral expression is instead looking threatening. Elevated testosterone levels, elevated levels of stress hormones, and your amygdala is going to be more active and your frontal cortex will be more sluggish. Pushing back further, weeks to months before, where's the relevance there? This is the realm of neural plasticity, the fact that your brain can change in response to experience. And if your previous months have been filled with stress, and trauma, your amygdala will have enlarged. The neurons will have become more excitable. Your frontal cortex would have atrophied, all relevant to what happens in that one second. But we push back even more, back years, back, for example, to your adolescence. Now, the central fact of the adolescent brain is all of it is going full blast, except the frontal cortex, which is still half-baked. It doesn't fully mature until you're around 25. And thus, Adolescence and early adulthood are the years where environment and experience sculpt your frontal cortex into the version you're going to have as an adult in that critical moment. But pushing back even further, even further back to childhood and fetal life and all the different versions that that could come in. Now, obviously, that's the time that your brain is being constructed, and that's important. But in addition, experience during those times produce what are called epigenetic changes, permanent, in some cases, permanently activating certain genes, turning off others. And as an example of this, if as a fetus, you were exposed to a lot of stress hormones from your mother, epigenetics is going to produce your amygdala in adulthood as a more excitable form, and you're going to have elevated stress hormone levels. But pushing even further back, back to when you were just a fetus, back to when all you were a collection of genes. Now, genes are really important to all of this, but critically, genes don't determine anything because genes work differently in different environments. Key example here, there's a variant of a gene called MAO-alpha. And if you have that variant, you are far more likely to commit antisocial violence if and only if you were abused as a child. 
genes and environment interact and what's happening in that one second before you pull that trigger reflects your lifetime of those gene environment interactions. Now, remarkably enough, we've got to push even further back now, back centuries. What were your ancestors up to? And if, for example, they were nomadic pastoralists, they were pastoralists, people living in the deserts or grasslands with their herds of camels, cows, goats, odds are they would have invented what's called a culture of honor, filled with warrior classes, retributive violence, clan vendettas, and amazingly, centuries later, that would still be influencing the values with which you were raised. But we've got to push even further back, back millions of years, because if we're talking about genes, implicitly, we're now talking about the evolution of genes. And what you see is, for example, patterns across different primate species. Some of them have evolved for extremely low levels of aggression. Others have evolved in the opposite direction and floating there in between by every measure are humans. Once again, this confused, barely defined species that has all these potentials to go one way or the other. So what has this gotten us to? Basically, what we're seeing here is if you want to understand a behavior, whether it's an appalling one, a wondrous one, or confusedly in between, if you want to understand that, you've got to take into account what happened a second before, to a million years before, everything in between. So what can we conclude at this point? Officially, it's complicated. Wow, that's really helpful. It's complicated and you better be real careful, real cautious before you conclude you know what causes a behavior, especially if it's a behavior you're judging harshly. Now to me, the single most important point about all of this is one having to do with change. Every bit of biology I have mentioned here can change in different circumstances. For example, ecosystems change. Thousands of years ago, the Sahara was a lush grassland. Cultures change. In the 17th century, the most terrifying people in Europe were the Swedes, rampaging all over the place. This is what the Swedish military does now. They haven't had a war in 200 years. Most importantly, brains change. Neurons grow new processes, circuits disconnect, everything in the brain changes, and out of this come extraordinary examples human change. We might so stop it there, Helen. This is a man named Thanks. John Newton. Back thank, to you, Peter. Thank you for that. I'll just go back to uh, my slides now. Um, one of the main reasons why I like that clip is as community psychologists, we're bombarded by other psychologists, particularly clinical and neuropsychs, telling us about what causes behavior and how the, the micro and in, intrapsychic aspects of our lives cause um, behavior. So what I liked about Robert Sapolsky's explanation is that um, we have to factor in context into, into the work and into our understandings. I'm going to push on a bit faster now just because of uh, time, so bear with me. So when, when we look at family violence models, there are essentially three different types of models. There's the individual behavioral model, um, which many psychologists use, um, such as anger management, which I've mentioned in other settings is a fairly flawed um, prospect in terms of this work, because many of the violent and abusive behaviors aren't necessarily um, triggered by anger or this some, in some cases they're cold and calculating behaviors. There's self-regulation, coping, mental illness strategies, couples therapy, family therapy, et cetera. And there's the feminist and human rights perspectives from the, the social areas. And I'll show you how they how they combine together in the work. In um, our work in Melbourne, we're heavily influenced by research that was um, conducted by organizations called Our Watch, Anne Rose and Vic Health um, in 2015, where they look, did an enormous literature review on the uh, drivers of family violence. And they used the the concept of drivers deliberately not causes because um, because of the scientific connotations with the term causes and factoring in as many different things as they could they could find in the research they they found that the strongest predictor of violence against women were was gender drivers such as the condone cultures that condone violence against women cultures that had uh, men controlling decision making uh, cultures that had rigid gender stereotypes and also cultures that had disrespect towards women and where men were involved with peer relations that also disrespected women. 
So what does this look like in practice? Um, I'll put all of these, these things up. So you can see there's a um, mixture of traditional psychological work where we work with triggers and we work on uh, empathy and emotional literacy and, and talking about power and control, self-regulation, so forth. There's also um, some of the broader structural issues that are, that are um, discussed and fed into the work within the Men's Behaviour Change Program. So I just want to um, shout out to Raywin uh, Connell, who we saw before, who, for her contribution to masculinity. It's been really profound body of work that she's contributed to that's informed our work in practice. Um, I'll talk a bit about accountability systems later, but I'm just conscious of time, so I'll go through these quickly. Um, of course, any volatile um, body of work comes with politics, and in fact, non-volatile um, <laughs> bodies of work also political, of course. Um, so some of the main critique of this, of this work has been that it's largely um, family violence is largely seen in binary terms. So it's men and women, victim survivors and perpetrators, people with full control or no control, um, whether people are believed or not believed. So that, um, some critics think that that's much too harsh. My personal view is I think that, that the binary presentation of this work has been critical in making steps forward. Um, uh, with working with uh, male perpetrators of family violence for a long period of time, I know that they uh, often will look for any excuse to avoid responsibility or accountability. So it's important that um, mo you know, models like having full control of their behavior has been useful as far as um, initiating change. And also uh, models such as believing survivors at face value is also really critical because as we know for so long, they haven't been believed. Um, the other critique involves this being a one size fits all model, uh, being heteronormative and cisnormative. So it hasn't um, looked at uh, instances where gender hasn't been as, as um, or the gender differences haven't been as pronounced. Um, and also, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the issue of accountability and excuses are really critical. So, um, in the men's behaviour change programs, we build up a web of accountability that involves contact with the men's ex-partners or current partners to see if what they're saying in the group or in the therapy actually happens in real life. Um, there's also other mechanisms of accountability like intervention orders, which are court-based orders that prohibit men from accessing children or attending um, their ex-partner's house, things like that. So. One of the reasons why trauma hasn't been looked at in a substantial way in this field is because people are worried that it will lead to men being excused for their violent behavior. There's also another element of punishment and justice that, that comes into this work, which I don't have time to discuss today. Maybe I can do that in another session. Um, just gonna, the next couple of slides are some alternative models. Um, this is another, um, model of family violence um, of the drivers of violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in Australia, which was done in collaboration with, with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women themselves. So you'll see down the bottom that gender factors still play an important role, but there's also the impact of colonisation plays a role, not just on how on the treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their communities, but also on how non-Aboriginal people see themselves as in terms of being superior or in, being, in terms of being entitled or in terms of seeing some of the um, injustices against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people rendered invisible. Again, I won't have time to go into much detail there, but I just want to show you that that model exists. Um, by the way, I've got references in the back of this slide too. So if people want my slides and, and all the references for these models, um, they'll be there. Another model which has come out this year in Melbourne um, through La Trobe University is the Pride in Prevention model, which looks at um, LGBTIQ people's experiences of violence. Um, and again, you can see that there's multiple layers of intervention and multiple um, drivers across different layers that, that provide an explanation for that. Just wanted to briefly introduce complex trauma. I understand that many people on the, in the session at the moment may, have, may know what this is, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But the, what distinguishes complex 
trauma or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, as you, you'll see it um, described in some areas, is the cumulative repetitive development of the trauma over multiple experiences of trauma. So um, essentially the person's um, neurobiology becomes rewired as a result of the traumatic experience and their behavior is affected by that. So th this is the um, definition that will go into the next um, international classification of diseases 11. You'll notice that it's not currently in the DSM um, maybe in the next edition it will find its way in there, but this, uh, the ICD-11 will, will um, come into practice in 2022. So the three main functions of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, in addition to what you would find in post-traumatic stress disorder, are that uh, the person present, presents with severe and pervasive problems in effect regulation, persistent beliefs about themselves as diminished, defeated, worthless, or an accompanied by deep and pervasive feelings of um, shame, guilt, or failure, um, and also persistent difficulties in sustaining relationships or feeling close to others. Um, some other work on this by Cordes and Ford um, described, I think, fairly succinctly that people with complex trauma have, in, in addition to hyperarousal and hypervigilance in relation to external danger, complex trauma poses for the person an internal threat of being unable to self-regulate, self-organize, or draw upon relationships to re regain self-integrity. So it becomes an all-encompassing experience for the person that, and the person sees the world through that lens of how they've been um, reshaped by the trauma. The next series of slides I'm gonna talk about come from the ACE study. Um, again, I've heard of this recently described as the most famous study that you've never heard of. Um, the ACE study was, was developed back in the 90s by um, Vincent Felitti and, and Robert Ander um, in the USA, where they, they studied 17,000 people uh, in San Diego, and they explored their adverse childhood experiences, which is what the ACE acronym stands for, adverse childhood experiences. And they found that the more adverse childhood experiences the people had, the higher their risk was of developing a range of other conditions throughout their lifetime, including high rates of attempting suicidality, high rates of drug use, high rates of alcoholism, high rates of unemployment, uh, people more likely to have chronic heart disease, more likely to have lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a range of social and physical health conditions and mental health conditions that were predicted by the number of ACEs people had. So the ACE questionnaire essentially is, is a questionnaire of 10 items which explore people's experience of childhood exposure to physical violence, emotional violence and neglect, um, sexual violence, whether one of their parents has been incarcerated, one of their, if one of their parents has had serious drug and alcohol problems, whether their parents have been divorced, etc. So I won't go into too much detail of that study. Um, but when it comes to the risk of perpetrating domestic violence, you can see this um, stepwise uh, risk that um, this study predicted. So if zero here means that um, this is the baseline, so people who had no adverse childhood experiences still perpetrated family violence, but the risk that they would um, conduct that behavior was elevated with the, the, um, the higher the number of ACEs that they had. So if people had more than five ACEs, that's the red bar at the end there. So this um, study has been used extensively throughout the world and has been replicated recently here's an example from a welsh study in 2015 um, i won't go through all the detail but it um, it predicted that um, aces the higher the number of the aces that people had predicted things like whether they would use heroin or, or crack cocaine whether they were incarcerated the next one in the middle here is their violence perpetration so they they believed if we could prevent aces in future generations we could decrease the amount of violence by 60 percent um, their study also found that people who had four or more ACEs were 15 times more likely to have committed violence against another person in the previous 12 months. So that's not just family violence, that's violence against all people. Uh, and you can see some of the other examples there as well. And the final slide on this um, study is um, that you can see the when they've 
adjust, done adjusted uh, odds ratio study, they found that people with four or more aces were it was a highly significantly more likely to commit violence in the previous 12 months than others. So th there's um, an increasing body of knowledge that shows us that trauma has an impact on um, people's propensity to be violent, although it doesn't cause that violence. It's, it elevates the risk of that violence happening. Other research has found that, uh, like this research from Vic Health a few years ago, has found that people, men are more likely to perpetrate violence against women if they've witnessed partner violence as a child or been subjected to child abuse. Although that doesn't mean that um, people with those experiences will go on to become perpetrators. And many men who have perpetrated family violence have not had that experience. So, um, and I've, I see that over the thousands of um, men that I've worked with that many people don't have that experience, but there are a substantial number of people who do. We also, anyone who studied the prison system will note that um, research consistently finds elevated risks of, tr risk, sorry, rates of trauma amongst incarcerated samples of both male and female prisoners. And um, other research has found that um, childhood sexual abuse survivors while most of them, over three quarters in this study, don't have an official criminal record, but those who did were almost five times more likely to be charged with, with offences. So again, there's um, more research that shows us that there's elevated risks, although it's not necessarily a conclusive um, narrow pathway. Now, back to you. How can we integrate work with complex trauma into our work with um, male perpetrators of family violence without this opening up to more excuses. Again, Helen, I may get you to field some of the questions here in the chat for me, please. Sure, Peter. Oh, so, sorry, in case I didn't make that clear, if you could write your thoughts in the chat room So we've got one from Elise, unmet knee, oh no, that's from the last time. Sorry, that the last question response. That's okay. Um, what I might do is, is move along then and we, I can pick, just so I've got some time at the end so oh. people can pick up this question or others. I've got some. <laughs> oh, sorry, great, sorry, Helen. <laughs> Joy said, use of DBT psychoeducation yeah. Um, Tiara said, destigmatize discussions around the topic so we can start developing community interventions. Great. Fantastic. I wish I was live with everyone so we could have a more robust discussion than, than a chat one. But thank you right. for both of those. One yeah. more from Beck. Integrating understanding of intergenerational trauma. Yes. Excellent. So um, intergenerational trauma, historical and and um, trauma and collective trauma are all really important aspects of this work as well. And Which Daniel, again, Daniel said, remove our own assumptions of experience. Thank you, Daniel. Very wise. Thank you all for that. I will keep moving to, so I've got some space at the end for more questions. So I just want to introduce two quick trauma models here that um, how trauma therapists have, have worked with violence. Um, John Briere, who's a Californian psychiatrist, has um, produced a model called the DRB, which stands for a distress reduction behavior. So his model suggests that many people who have experienced complex trauma will use compulsive and dangerous activities to manage their distress and, and reduce their anxiety. So for, for example, some people may self-harm, they may cut themselves. Some people may use compulsive sexual behavior or gambling or shoplifting or um, range of activities like that, drinking uh, or using drugs. Um, and violence is one of those behaviors as well. So people sometimes try to manage their environment if they're feeling anxious or they're feeling distressed or they're feeling powerless by using violence to reassert control. Um, and he, his work involves managing the distress of triggers, including implicit triggers, um, which are the triggers that we're not conscious of. So it might be um, the tone in which someone talks to us, or it might be the way someone looks at us or those sorts of things. So part of this work is in, involves 
helping the client explore those implicit triggers and trying to find out ways of short circuiting, circuiting the um, dangerous responses and producing other responses in uh, instead. I believe that it's too simplistic to assume that either none of family violence or all of it is related to this. Um, but I think there's a way of reconciling this, but I think people may be triggered, for example, by perceived rejections or feeling insulted um, and having gendered frames around those insults, um, such as, you know, if a man believes that he's lost status because a woman has told him what he should think or something, then that might trigger him. So there's a combination of gendered power and control and, um, and the other implicit trigger that goes with that. So working on this will take a lot of time, of course, but I think it's an important step. Another model which is really useful in um, trauma work is Janina Fisher's um, animal instincts model or her structural dissociation model, as she calls it. So in this model, um, she says that we have an apparently normal part of our persona, which is the part of us that goes on and makes appointments and does shopping and um, you know, gets on with our normal lives. And then we have an emotional part which carries some of the distress of our traumatic experience. And that we have what she calls five animal instincts, which instinctively will be used to protect ourselves from threat. So some of us may be prone to fighting as a way of protecting ourselves from, from any perceived threat. Some of us will, will use flight or run away or distance ourselves or hide from the threat. Some people will freeze. Some people will submit and acquiesce and just to get through that situation without any more harm occurring. And some people will attach to others or will look for extra support to manage that, that, um, that threat. So this is used therapeutically um, by focusing on questions such as which part do you use more often than others? Um, which part is worried at the moment that um, you're not getting what you want or you're, you're, you know, you're not feeling settled or whatever the, the, the context of the, que of the um, question is. How can, other, how can you use other parts? So instead of using fight all the time, how can you use the attachment part to, to, re you know, to call on other people for support? Or are there times when it's best that you say nothing or just go along with things rather than react violently or aggressively um, to what you perceive as a threat? So this is another quick model. Normally we could do this in half a day, but of course we don't have that time. So I just wanted to briefly introduce this as well. This model is really useful when people feel overwhelmed. Um, you can break down that overwhelm by focusing on parts that may be useful for people. So the, the fusion between the individual work and the, the more structural work, I think, comes down to what people perceive as a threat. Um, Sometimes people will be threatened by rigid gender stereotypes and their identities and their norms, which is why that's a really critical part of this work. But um, there's also a part of um, this which involves what Francis Fukuyama called the politics of resentment amongst those who are social deteriorating. And um, we can see that with white men uh, who see that, perceive that their status is deteriorating socially and are now involved in lots of backlash. Um, to try to maintain that, that sense of status, which they feel entitled to. Again, we could do a whole session just on that. Um, I won't go through this, uh, this slide in much detail other than th this is some examples of um, the man box work that this study was done in Australia, but there's these studies about the man box that have been done all around the world. Um, people who subscribed to the man box, which is rigid gender stereotypes about how a man should behave are also at high risk of um, getting into physical fights themselves, um, have, uh, committing suicide, um, and also crashing their cars, this, this study found. So there's a whole range of violent backlash effects that the men who have those rigid gender stereotypes can receive themselves as victims of, of violence, either at the hands of themselves or at the hands of others. All right. In trauma work, um, there's a three-phased approach that has been adopted in recent years. The first phase is to focus on safety and stabilization. So that is to make sure that people have enough self-regulation skills and enough safety around them to be able to manage 
the difficult material that will come up when they start processing the trauma, which is the second phase. Um, and then the third phase is integration. So once people have processed the trauma into a cohesive narrative and to and being able to talk about their trauma experiences without being strongly triggered by them, or if they are strongly triggered, being able to manage that, then the integration phase is um, focusing on other aspects of their lives that they may have lost or that they may, have, may have been corrupted as a result of the trauma, like finding a satisfying relationship or uh, finding employment and so forth. Um, so I think this model could be really useful in working with, with men. The, um, there's also five principles of trauma-informed practice, which um, are often touted as the way of working with clients with trauma. Um, these are safety, trust, choice, collaboration, and empowerment. Um, and I think they have, in my view, they have assumptions that don't necessarily suit work with men. Um, who have acted violently against their family because the assumptions are that um, people who've who are, are a survivor or a victim of violence or trauma um, are in a largely powerless position. And a lot of the principles of trauma-informed practice talk about e um, trying to equalize that power and balance between people. And that may not work well with people who are actually exercising behaviors that are dominant and controlling and where they're exercising power over other people. Um, so I suggest we need to think of a few adjustments if we are going to adopt this model into this work. Um, critically, when we're looking at people's safety, when we're working with people who are um, violating the safety of other people, we have to attend to those other parties' safety as well. So in this case, um, women and children's safety as well. So they have to be um, treated as paramount in this work. We also need to explore the man's uh, concept of social threat. So it may not be what we expect. Um, when it comes to trust, unfortunately, the, um, the incidence of um, collusion and coercion and manipulation is extremely high in, uh, when we work with this population. So rather than um, adopt a stance of empathy, we, we use what we call skeptical empathy, which is still trying to be empathic with the people that we work with and, and trying to understand where they're coming from. But also carry, we carry with us a grain of doubt that there may be more to the story than what we're being told. Um, so, you know, trust has, has limitations around that, that aspect, I think. When it comes to choice, um, I think we can explore perceptions of choice um, and the person's sense of choice may be very different than what we would consider their, their choices to be. Um, we should also highlight that violence is a choice and expand their, their um, options of responding to what they consider to be threats. When it comes to collaboration, we also need to attend to other people's needs and be very aware of attempts to collude, coerce and manipulate, as I've um, mentioned before. And when it comes to empowerment, um, this work, it's critical in my view that we should work on aspects such as equality, entitlement, and privilege um, when we're working with men. So it's not just about empowering them and lifting them up to a place where they have more power. It's about understanding power from a very different position. Sorry that I've raced through that. I recognize we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I won't go through all of these just because of the time and because I've got, I want to allow time for questions. Um, but I think there's many things that we can do in this work where we can fuse trauma models into the men's behavior change work or the, or the working with men who have been violent against their partners, um, which include screening, include working with implicit triggers, working with shame is really critical and looking at different ways of working with men. They may not suit group work. They may be best to work in uh, with individuals or there may be parallel models where we work on someone's trauma first and then they become ready to, for the for the uh, work with their violence um, we're still yet to do this work in any substantial way so we're still in the early days when it comes to new directions i think we do need to avoid the one size fits all sausage machine where we just get people to attend groups or attend therapy and expect that they'll live happily ever after at the end um, we need to have much more nuanced models in the state where i'm living at the moment and working victoria 
there's um, new models of case management around this work, which try to um, give people more variation in their response. I've mentioned this before, working in parallel with, um, with group treatment and case management is important. There needs to be a lot more work as someone mentioned before about intergenerational trauma, historical trauma and collective trauma. Um, so we haven't explored that in great detail in this work, but I think that's a critical aspect of the work that's been neglected up until now. Um, I'm also in another um, aspect of my working life, working with virtual reality to test how we can use virtual reality and new technologies to try to reduce violent behavior. So some of this work involves developing um, a better understanding of empathy and also testing people's um, new skills under pressure. Um, that work is really brand new. In fact, we, we're still working on, on it conceptually before we've um, tested that yet, but that's something else that's coming up in the future, I think. All right, my final slide before I throw open for questions. Um, there's also lots of work we can do with the community. So working on cultural change, working on gender equality, um, working with men to develop new norms around what male culture should be, that in fact, new norms that don't involve violence. Um, lots of my work at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, involves bystander work. So helping people step in when they see sexist behavior or um, violent or abusive behavior, uh, helping organizations develop policies and procedures where they can respond to family violence, um, either at home or, or with their employees who are affected by that the violence at home or, or in the workplace. As we know, sometimes the violence continues into the workplace. Um, we need to also pay more attention to our communities as spaces where family violence and intergenerational violence can be prevented and where interventions are tested. Um, I did another workshop in Victoria in recently on using community space as, as the place where therapy is, uh, is um, is tested. So therapy either works or it doesn't work in community settings. And I think then our community psychologists have got a really good opportunity to work with therapists to help them um, construct communities that are more conducive to um, long term change. So I'll leave that question because of time. I've got about five minutes left. My concluding um, position on this is I think equality is the best therapy. Um, so we need to, we, you know, it's all very well doing individual and group work with people and doing therapeutic work, which, which I believe is important, but it's the social conditions that we also need to attend to, to make inroads into this. There you go. So there's my details if people want to contact me. Um, and now I'll throw to you, Helen, for questions. Do you want to stop sharing, Peter, and then we can uh, see everybody? Yeah, thank and you. And if people want to wave and we can recognize them so they can turn their um, mics on or I'll drive the chat for you. I just want to say thank you. Um, not being somebody that works in this area and just happening to be the one hosting the room, it, that was really interesting. And that whole idea of attending to the social conditions um, you know, from my work in education, I find it really interesting that the Victorian government here, um, Melbourne and the rest of the state of Victoria, have implemented the Rights, Responsibilities and Respectful Relationships program in schools. And that whole, hope it'll take generations to change. Um, interesting. That's right, yeah. So was just, will that put you out of a job? No, no therapy. No, actually, I was I was involved in doing some of the pilot work on that program. Okay. Yeah, but I hope it does put me out of a job. If we can eliminate violence, I'll be the happiest person, or maybe not the happiest person, but I'll be one of them. That, um, as community psychs, we work on ugly issues throughout our careers, so we're very happy to see the end of them. That's why why we're doing the work. Okay. Uh, Tiara says, thank you very much. I might have missed it, but have any approaches been shown to be more effective with Indigenous folks? There's some, um, I don't know about that as a conclusive 
summary to that, but uh, I know that there's new work that's being done with Indigenous people to look at intergenerational trauma. There's there's new models being tested. I haven't seen the results of those of those models yet, so I can't say whether they're bet they're more effective or not. But I I do think that the experimental approach with those communities is a really promising sign. Um, we can't divorce people's behaviour from their culture, anyone's. So it's critical. Uh, and I'd advise, I'd, I'd suggest that people look at that um, study called Changing the Picture from our watch. It's a, a downloadable free document, uh, which you can get as a PDF um, from the Our Watch website, which talks about, um, particularly in Australian context, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander violence. Peter, it's Heather here. I don't think I can get my video to work for some reason, but at least I can... I can hear you. You can hear me. That's, <laughs> and that picture is probably a better one anyway. Um, I look, I just I thought it was great, and thank you. Um, and uh, you always make me think about something I hadn't thought about before. Um, but I was just wondering, I mean, in a really kind of kind of crude way, that the chart, the one you said, the research we, the, the, we've probably never heard of, um, is do you have a way of explaining how come like mostly you know I've sometimes used to say that if if if, if trauma explains um, you know violent behavior then people would have to have a sex change particularly if you're talking about experiences of abuse because on the whole it's women or girls who have more experiences of victimhood but they are not the ones who turn into abusers largely there's obviously exception exceptions to that so i wonder if you can just say a little bit about how come uh, men I, I i mean i've got my own answers but i'm interested in yours are, are more likely to respond to those experiences with you know with violence not all men obviously have to put that one in um than than women are in general sure um I think a crude answer to that, sort of generalise again here, is um, that men are socialised to use violence as, as a solution to emotional issues. Um, whereas women, you know, again, generalising, women are more likely to commit violence against themselves through self-harming behaviours, mm. um, you know, cutting or using pills or things like that, whereas men are more likely to be violent towards other people, but also mm. to themselves as well. I mean, in Australia, 75% of suicides are um, conducted by men. So mm. violence is seen by many men as an appropriate way of sorting things out and quickly resolving difficult emotional issues. And they get heaps of encouragement for that. Yeah, that's right. And, and men are also increasingly likely to be violent against each other so male violence against other men and also mm -hmm. increasingly violent to be uh, sorry increasingly likely to be violent against themselves through suicide mm. i guess the corollary of that question is the closer we approach equality are we likely to see more violent um outward expression from women mm. yeah. i mean i think we do we do see it in terms of you know in my day we used to talk about women drivers as meek and you know, tentative, and we don't tend to hear that so much these days, I don't think, because probably because we've all grown up driving and it's not such an issue, but I think it's also partly that expression of having, you know, women have more agency than they thought they had, and sometimes that's used badly. Yeah, so my quick answer to that is possibly, but it won't be in the same magnitude as what we've seen in previous generations of male violence, I don't yeah. think. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've kind of just about reached, we have reached the end of our time, but there's one quick question there from Leone, um, and maybe we can finish on that, Peter, is do you think being a bloke is an advantage with working with violent men? Uh, yes, because male privilege um, carries through that work as well. So, um, but it's not, I would also encourage women to be involved in this work. In fact, some of the greatest practitioners I've seen in this work are women. Um, so in the men's behaviour change groups that I've been doing, we have a one male, one female facilitator to try to demonstrate gender equality and to try to sh demonstrate what respectful relations looks like. Although it's much harder for the woman being the only woman in that room um, than it is for the male facilitator. So there's definitely a privilege there for the men, in my view. Wonderful. Thank you for a very thought-provoking session. 
Um, it's now officially a lunch break. Um, and then leading into networking sessions and then our time zone break. So we virtually have six and a half hours break till the next presentations, but we invite you to grab your lunch and come back and do some networking if you're not going to sleep or <laughs> whatever is happening in your time zone. So a big thank you to Peter, um, many applause. Um, oh, thank you applause what do you call those things emoticons on the um reactions on on the screen and that's wonderful so so thank you and we survived we survived the technology <laughs> we did we did well <laughs> all right so if you go back to the on air um window that you've got that you should be able to have concurrently open with your zoom window and that will have the program um, on the on air platform um, through the web and it will indicate the breaks until 1.30 and then there's a networking session um, starting at oh sorry Melbourne time 1.30 whatever it is your time and then an hour later there's net, a networking session that's uh, you can join the Australian Psychological Society of, Common, uh, of Community Psychology um, and meet up with them or you could do a social drop-in for research students so if you are in the time zone that that works we welcome you to those otherwise we possibly welcome you back in six and a half hours for concurrent session three so thank you thank you all right i'll stop the recording peter and hope that worked Stop the recording.